I might let you stand again in a little a minute because I realized there was something I wanted to, uh, uh, a short teaching I wanted to give before we actually do the compassion practice. And, and the intention behind giving this teaching on the three kinds of suffering, I already listed, you know, many more than three kinds of suffering. But this is sort of like three traditional categories of suffering and the intention of this teaching is to show you that it's not just what we ordinarily um, think of as suffering. For instance, for many people it's very easy to think of a laboratory animal and feel compassion or any animals uh, being treated cruelly and uh, to feel compassion. And sometimes to the degree that we actually can't bear it, but still it automatically flows. And there's other, uh, other things that easily uh, awaken our heart. So the, uh, those things are in a category called the suffering of suffering or ordinary suffering. It may not be, seem so ordinary because it's so, there's so much cruelty involved, but the suffering of suffering or ordinary suffering is what we usually refer to as suffering. And when we do compassion practices, it's uh, usually at this level, which you could say is the outer level, the, the suffering of, um, of neglect, the suffering of poverty, the pr suffering of hunger and thirst, the suffering of homelessness, the suffering of uh, uh, violence, uh, the suffering of discrimination. All of these are considered uh, a suffering of suffering or outer suffering, level of outer suffering or ordinary suffering. And the word ordinary doesn't mean to belittle these things. It's, uh, it's a healthy, category in its own. And these categories come from uh, the Buddha. But then, the, then uh, there's uh, deeper layers of suffering, which are uh, sometimes not acknowledged. And one of them is uh, the second one uh, kind of suffering is the suffering of impermanence. The suffering that's uh, somewhat inherent in being a human being that you want uh, things to remain the same and they don't. Uh, that uh, <clears throat> you would like it, for instance, uh, we have this curious um, but all very uh, uh, universal uh, propensity to um, prefer pleasure to pain. <laughs> <laughs> and even those who prefer pain, <laughs> there are quite a few websites devoted to that. <laughs> uh, they get pleasure from it, so it's in the pleasure category. <laughs> so we prefer pleasure to pain, and that seems like a non no-brainer that we would, but it actually that is kind of lopsided because it uh, doesn't allow or give the space or uh, it doesn't give uh, uh, kindness and compassion and um, uh, doesn't allow for a whole, whole um, huge part of the human experience. So the suffering of impermanence includes the fact that there is pleasure in life, but it alternates and uh, shifts and changes. So you have, a, 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 let's say, like falling in love. Uh, it's a real high when two people love each other and they fall in love. And there's that period, which is even if they uh, never get married, it's sort of called the honeymoon period because it's so pleasurable and brings out the best in both of you, usually. And uh, you often feel a tenderness, not just for the beloved, but for the whole world and other people. It just like awakens such a tenderness in you. 
So somehow if you could keep that open, receptive, uh, allowing tenderness alive, it would be a good thing. But what usually happens is that uh, after some time, you begin to find fault with the beloved. Or, and or, usually, and they also find fault with you. And then the honeymoon is over. <laughs> and you scramble and scramble and try to get it back. But actually, you've entered into a maturing phase of your relationship, a, uh, a, a going deeper with your relationship, a knowing each other more intimately, and uh, being able to keep that open heart and open mind to each other when you're uh, so irritated by each other. And uh, so the uh, wanting to just to stay smooth and open forever uh, doesn't happen just because of things change. And we change. And uh, so there's an alternation that happens with um, uh, something pleasurable sh sh morphing into something that is uh, disappointing because you held out such hope for the pleasure to last. My brother and I used to eat Hershey's chocolate bars in the summer. We'd both maybe get one. And it was summertime, so they were melting as we held them in our hands. And the, the uh, challenge was who could make their Hershey's chocolate bar last the longest? <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was like wanting it to last forever, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, even as young children, we quickly learned that it didn't last forever, that the taste finally was gone. Whether we won and did it the longest or not, it still passed. So there is pleasure in life. There is great beauty in life. There is great appreciation and gratitude in life. There is great... Uh, uh, so much uh, goodness in life. And uh, uh, my daughter uh, said to me when she was like uh, 14 or something, and I was talking to her about the Buddhist teachings on suffering, and she said, uh, uh, well, if, the, if there wasn't any pleasure, she said, then uh, this whole thing would work a lot better. And what she meant was that because there's pleasure, then you want that to be it. And then it shifts, and then you feel uh, very unhappy. And you feel the sense of loss, the sense of disappointment. So there's this more subtle level of suffering, which is inherent in being a uh, being like ourselves, uh, who wishes for the ple pleasure and wishes that the uh, discomfort would not, la would not be there, and the fact that there, because things are changing, uh, it's inherent in our situation. And then this really uh, becomes very uh, dramatic when, I mean, very heightened to, in our awareness when we, when we do hold out hope for outer things to make us happy. That's when you really learn about disappointment <laughs> and impermanence. Because uh, you get a new article of clothing, clothing, and almost everybody, when they get the new article of clothing, it's certainly true of me, although I rarely get any new <laughs> articles of clothing, but uh, when I do, and they all look just like the old articles of clothing. <laughs> nevertheless, um, uh, there's... Um, there's this uh, pleasurable feeling of something new. And then, uh, you know, you, you uh, tear it, you stain it, you uh, lose it, you, it, it, it uh, or if it just stays perfect for a long time, it's boring after a while. <laughs> it's that old shirt that you've had for so long. And uh, it's the same with a new car, a new uh, piece of uh, something, equipment, a new computer, a new uh, uh, piece of furniture, a new uh, place to live, a new anything. There is a kind of high 
Uh, I hear that for shopping, for instance, they call it, what do they call shopping therapy or something like that, because it cheers you up. But it's built into it, inherent in it, is a kind of pain because of the fact that uh, that, that particular uh, high or pleasure that we get from outer things, whether it's relationship or blouses, uh, 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 is subject to impermanence. So that's w another kind of suffering that's more subtle, and that's very universal. So sometimes when people are doing compassion practices, they say, well, how, how can I do compassion practice for someone I don't know, like a stranger, because I have no idea what, what, if they have any pain in their life at all. Well, you could guarantee that they do have this pain of, of uh, impermanence or uh, shifting the fact that things just don't remain the same. And then there's the uh, most subtle of all, and which is called all-pervasive suffering. And that is the suffering of um, wanting ourselves, uh, our own situation, to remain uh, stable, not wanting uh, insecurity, not wanting uncertainty, wanting predictability, wanting uh, uh, a sense of security, uh, uh, something that we can hold on to. And for the same reason that uh, the second suffering based on impermanence, uh, we also are not a uh, fixed identity. We are shifting, changing all the time, and we experience that as a kind of anxiety, a hum of anxiety in the background because of the fact that we can't seem to uh, get ground under our feet in any kind of final way. And so we're subject to insecurity, sub subject to uh, 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 uncertainty, subject to um, uh, not knowing what's going to happen next. And so that more subtle level of, of suffering or pain, which is called the suffering uh, all-pervasive pain or all-pervasive pervasive discontent, again, you could do uh, compassion practice for anyone and know that <clears throat> they are, uh, that they do feel insecure, insecurity, they do feel uncertainty, they do feel uh, like they don't know what's uh, going to happen next. So there's these uh, deepening and deepening layers of uh, suffering, and we could experience them in our own self and then be, have the uh, recognition that this other person, this loved one, this uh, stranger, this difficult person also uh, suffers in these uh, deeper and deeper ways and wish for them to be, ourselves to be free of it, and wish for them to be free of it. Now, in wishing for ourselves to be free of the all-pervasive suffering, uh, that doesn't mean at all that we wish that we would never feel insecure again. It means that we are comfortable. We can allow uh, the feeling of insecurity, and we don't struggle against it. It's just part of our experience. I was talking recently with somebody, and uh, a teenage um, uh, girl, uh, 18 years old, and she, she said to me, it was so, uh, showed such wisdom, she said, because of my early childhood uh, and having an alcoholic mother, she said, I'm coming to realize that this feeling of never having enough is just something I'm going to have to live with and make friends with, because I don't think it's in the cards that it's going to actually go away. And I thought that's probably true because of the particular cause, conditions of her early childhood. There was like a wound there uh, that left her feeling needy and wanting more. And that uh, she was never going to be, nothing was ever going to completely fulfill that, but she could be okay with that. 
and, not, and that would mean that she wasn't, didn't feel like a victim, didn't have so much neediness, or at least recognized when she was needy. And she could begin to relax with the fact that this was just one of the things uh, that was part of her life, and it didn't need to be a big problem for her. In fact, it could be the basis of empathy for other people in the same boat. So uh, if you want to stretch just once more, then we will do the practice of receiving compassion.